Positive flight attitude, that means a couple of different things. You know, positive flight attitude in terms of keeping the airplane in a positive flight attitude and upright, but also keeping your attitude in the appropriate place to do that. So, you know, we all hear about situational awareness, and it's kind of like being told to be safe. How do you do that? It sounds really good, but, you know, telling me to be safe and telling me, uh, you know, that I don't know exactly what to do in order to do that. And I, I was thinking about it because situational awareness is part of, it goes with the theme of this year's safety stand down, which is don't be surprised, be prepared. And being prepared in means keeping, making sure that your situational awareness is right. And so, I, you know, I sat down and thought about what does that mean and what do, what do we do? How do we actually keep track of, of what our situational awareness is? You're probably familiar with the FA safety team's perceive, process, and perform. And I think of that as perceive what is it doing, whatever it happens to be. The process part is always the tough one for, for most of us because if we, if we know what it is and we understand what it's about, then we know what to do about it, which is the next part. But this is the what can it, whatever it happens to be, what can it do to me? And then the last part is perform. What can I do to be safe and to make sure that, me, that my passengers and I are all safe? And uh, because uh, the theme of this was awareness, um, and uh, I know that there are a lot of acronyms floating around in aviation, so I decided, why don't I make up another one? And you don't have to remember it this way, but uh, it, was, it was at least uh, a device for presentational purposes. So, um, and by the way, please don't tell this guy, he's a, he's a CAP friend of mine, and I snapped his picture, and he has no idea he's being used in this. So um, uh, let's just keep that a little secret. Uh, the first part of AWARE is your aircraft, and we'll talk about that. Second part is weather. That's a big one for all of us, and I think that's one of the toughest things for a lot of pilots to, to deal with. How is it that we look at, think about, deal with weather? And it's something I've put a lot of time and thought into. Uh, the next part is airspace, and we all know that we have some very complicated airspace in this country nowadays, and even if you live in uncomplicated airspace, you never know when a uh, temporary flight restriction is going to come up, and so there's a lot to be aware of there. The next one is reality. What's it really doing as opposed to what we would like for it to be doing? So we'll, look, we'll take a look at that. And then finally, external pressures. I think this is the most insidious one of all because we are all pushed along a lot of times by things we just don't we, we aren't consciously aware of, we just know that we're feeling some pressure to do something. So let's, let's get right into the um, aircraft. Um, what, the, these are some of the things that I think you need to be aware of with respect to your airplane. What is its mechanical condition? Now, that means airworthiness, and uh, can somebody tell me what does airworthy mean? What does airworthy mean? Go. It's fit to fly, that's right. There's, there's an official um, designation that it, it's in conformance with its type certificate, but also that it is in a condition for safe flight. And one of the things that I use, another acronym, you've seen this one, I didn't make this one up, uh, Aviate, um, the annual inspection and the, uh, any airworthiness directives, VOR check if that's required. The, the little I there is actually a one for 100 hour if it's used for higher flight instruction. Then you have um, the altimeter and pedostatic system check, the transponder and the ELT. And that's one of the little things that I use to, to go through and see if the airplane uh, is legally in condition um, for to go. Um, as far as in condition for safe flight, now, once you got, you're got, you sure that all the paperwork is there, it's still not necessarily in condition for safe flight. And let me give you a little example. One day I had a student and we checked before he went out to pre-flight the airplane, we checked to make sure that all of these, you know, aviate, everything was there, all the, 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 the airplane as far as the paperwork was concerned was perfectly legal to fly. So I sent him out to do his pre-flight in the Cessna 152 and I, I watched from a safe distance. He didn't know I was watching, but I always do. Uh, so I, he, I watched him uh, do his pre-flight, and then I walked out there when it looked like he was about ready. And as I was approaching, I said, so how's the airplane? He said, it's, it's fine, the oil's a little low. I said, what, define a little low? He said, four quarts. 
well, is that good for Cessna 152? Because I'm you know, always asking questions. He said, yes. And for pattern work, that was, that was a perfectly fine answer. So I walk around to my side of the airplane, and as I'm walking around, the nose gear fairing was covered with oil, fresh oil. And it was dripping down. I could see it dripping down. And I said, uh, what about that? Oh, yeah, I was wondering about that. He says, ah, OK, remedial pre-flight. Uh, it was good to wonder about that. I said, basically, the airplane is bleeding. We don't know why. But we're going to go, we're, it's grounded as of now. Because even though all the paperwork was in order, this airplane, as we found it, was not in a condition for safe flight. So one of the things that I, I would advise you, always approach an airplane with the idea that uh, you know something is going to be wrong and be pleasantly surprised. You be prepared to find something wrong and be surprised if everything is, is actually in good shape. Um, and that's part. That's one of the reasons we do a pre-flight. Now, if you have ever done a pre-flight where it's the kind that you just sort of phone it in, I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but you know if you've maybe been in a hurry and maybe you just did the things a little bit more quickly than you should have and maybe you just kind of went around, well, that's the sort of thing they'll get you in trouble because those are, if your mindset is such that you're not prepared to do a good, solid pre-flight, then maybe you're going to miss some things. Um, in flight, uh, one of the things I wanted to say about in flight is, OK, you're flying along. And how, how many people fly airplanes that, you know, it's it, whether you own or rent, it's usually a pretty typical range of airplanes that, that you fly. I mean, I know I do. I have my club's airplane, and there are certain ones that I rent from time to time. You kind of know what to expect from those airplanes. They sound a certain way, and they, the, the gauges are going to read a certain way. And what do you do if something is off? Well, that's when you should start paying attention to a lot of other things. It's not a neat and there's, there's never a good time to panic in an airplane. Panic is very unseemly, and it won't get you where you need to go. But the, the time to really be paying attention is if you are flying an airplane and, and something doesn't look quite right or feel quite right or sound quite right, start looking a little bit harder for what's there. That's part of the situational awareness that we're talking about. And then post-flight, OK, you're done. You know, you've tied down the airplane, everything's fine. But we're, we're all taught, I hope, to, at the, at, at, after you've finished a flight, go around and look at everything again. Make sure that uh, it's one way to make sure that you haven't left any lights on, one way to make sure that all three tie downs are on. I found planes with one or two before because somebody got in a hurry. But it's also a, a time to check and see if there's anything that looks like it needs attention before the next flight. So all of these things are about being very much aware of your airplane. It's legal condition and it's fitness to fly. And, you know, the, um, I, I like, uh, it, this sounds like a Vulcan word, a Klingon word, TLR, uh, but that looks about right. I mean, but you could also say that sounds about right. And I'm not suggesting, you know, I call this the science of situational awareness, but there's also an art to it. And I, I preach a lot about paying attention to the feelings that you have. If you have a gut feeling that something's just not right, start looking a little bit harder to see what is or isn't right. Another part of airplanes, especially now, are systems. How many fly something G glass? G1000, others? Yep. Some? Yeah, there, there's some great stuff out there. But uh, you, you, so you, need to, you always need to understand the basic instruments and especially the automation. Now, with automation, one of the things that I've, um, I, I kind of like to think about it is there are three skills involved in it. Information management, this, these, are, these airplanes are like Burger King, have it your way. You can put everything on the screen in exactly what order you want, and you're perfectly entitled to do that. Do what works for you. I like heading up. I get in airplanes and somebody's got north up, well, you know, I go change the keys and I fix it the way that, that I want it and the way that I'm comfortable with flying. But information management also means knowing what kind of information that you need to have on the screen for any given phase of flight. Um, sometimes, and I have certain screens set up the way that, that I like them. Um, there's one with a flight plan where I can see a split view between text and the moving map. Um, it, but information management is what do you need to know right now? It's also, there's lots of information in these things. 
And you need to know how to get to whatever it is that you need to get to with a couple of keystrokes. Um, second is automation management. Um, I'm not talking about just the autopilot, although the what's it doing now is a famous question that uh, if, if you have to ask what's it doing now, it's time to shut it off and make sure that you know what it's doing and then you can re-engage the autopilot. But automation ma management is also knowing what the systems will automatically do for you and knowing um, as well what you have to manually do. And I've been surprised more than once, you know, if I've gone between systems, um, Avidyne did it one way, Garmin did it the other way, and I was in one and expecting it to behave like the other, and I, yeah, I got surprised. I got what we call automation surprise. Um, so automation management is, is being aware of what mode you're in. Is it flight director or autopilot, or am I in not any mode at all? What am I expecting it to do? And if it's doing something that you don't expect it to do, that's the time to turn off the automation and go back to, some people call it go green, go raw data, whatever. But you don't want the airplane doing things that you don't know about. Um, the next thing is risk management. Just because it looks like an airliner, it's still bolted into a general aviation airplane in, in the case of a lot of what we're flying. And risk management to me involves a, a lot of understanding that, hey, it may look like I've got, and I do have a lot of capability here, but I'm still flying a light general aviation airplane. And I still have a lot, I have still have the limitations that go with that. I mean, there are a ton of things that we can do, but we just need to make sure that we're aware and constantly aware that this cannot do everything for us. Um, and we can't, we, the, the gadgets can't make up for just the basic limitations of the airplane. Now we're gonna look at weather. Um, and this is, this is one of my favorite parts, mostly because weather was one of the most challenging things for me to learn. I went, like everybody else in here in ground school, I went through all the weather theory. I went through all the weather code, which I admit I like. Um, but, I, and at the, when I got my instrument rating, I remember thinking, okay, now what? What do I do with this? You know, I, I didn't really have a framework to think about it. And this is, some, this is helpful. What is the weather doing? What can it do to me? And then what can I do to be safe? And I always think that if you have the first part, uh, it's, it's that second part, the processing, what can it do to me? that if we know that, then, then we're in a much better position to perform and know what we can do to be safe. And uh, by the way, I hope we all know that we're not gonna go flying anything in weather that looks like uh, what's on the screen there. Thunderstorms or bad news, no matter what. Okay, where do I start? When I, when I first started flying, uh, we still had a flight service station that I could walk to next door, and, and the, I would ask for a printout in the days when you ask for a printout instead of using your iPad and for flight and all the other cool stuff that we have now. And they would give me this stack of paper. And I would remember, I would, and, it, and you know, you start going through it and it looks like what's on uh, the code there. And I would sit there and look at it and I felt like my Cocker Spaniel looking at a clock. And, huh? What is this? What do I do with this? And it's not that I hadn't been taught. I knew how to read it, but now what do I do with it? Uh, how do I make sense of this? And so I, I eventually came up with a framework, and it, I didn't come up with it all by myself, thanks to uh, Ralph Buck's book about the weather. If you think about what are the things that weather can do to a pilot, and it can create wind. You're talking about crosswinds and turbulence. Uh, reduce ceiling and visibility, clouds, rain, fog, all the other stuff. And here's the third thing, it can affect aircraft performance. And those are things like high density altitude and icing. So if you can break down whatever the weather is, and first of all, think about which one of these things is it that is gonna be an issue, that starts to, to take that huge stack of paper or the huge stack of electrons, whichever one you have, and it starts to make, uh, to, to give you a way to make sense out of it. Now, um, this is, I put weather code up here, or like I said, I admit I like it, but it was easier to put up here for, uh, for showing here. So if you look at what we can weather do, uh, along the top there is a METAR for my home airport. And if you look at, the way, at the, the way that the information is structured, it really provides you uh, wind, ceiling, and visibility, and performance. And when I say performance, you've got the altimeter setting, but temperature dew point, of course, that bleeds into also ceiling and visibility. But you know, in hot weather, the, the, the high, higher the temperature, that's gonna tell you something about your aircraft performance right there. 
So you can, when you start to get your weather briefing, I would encourage you to start thinking in terms of is it wind, is it ceiling and visibility, or is it performance? Which, which of these things, and it might be two of the three, one of the three, or three of the three, but which of these things is the issue that I need to be prepared to deal with? Uh, know what I can deal with. So when, when wind, when you've got wind, um, there are questions to ask about both the pilot and the airplane. Now let me introduce another concept. I like to think of the pilot and the aircraft as a team. So, you know, I cannot compensate for what the airplane cannot do, and the airplane can't compensate for what I can't do. We have to work together. And if I'm flying a Cub, or if I'm flying a Cessna 152, what that team can do is different than what I can do if I'm flying, say, a Piper Aztec. That's or, or a 182, or if I'm flying steam gauges versus glass, or if I have weather uh, versus if I have weather data link or not, those are all things that they're involved. So when it comes to uh, to wind conditions, I I tend to think of that as an issue where you have to ask questions about the pilot's capabilities and the airplane's capabilities. The pilot, and for me, that's okay. So how good am I? If you have, a, if your airplane has, let's say it has a 15 knot maximum demonstrated crosswind component, that's gonna be a pretty fair amount of wind to get to that crosswind component. Does that mean you can't go? What is the, is the crosswind maximum demonstrated crosswind a limitation? No, it's not, yeah, uh, that, that is correct. It's not, but on the other hand, consider that that number was derived by a test pilot in ideal conditions, you know, and by ideal, I mean very uh, control conditions. And this is the part I always like the best. That test pilot is simulating average pilot skills. Now, I like to think I'm good, but I'm not convinced that I, that so a test, that I'm still as good as a test pilot, a professional who is simulating average pilot skills. So, uh, so bear in mind that when you look at performance numbers that, that these were done by test pilots, new airplanes, uh, control conditions, and everything else. So you always want to, to, to give yourself a margin there. So I'm looking at, when I look at wins, I'm thinking about it in terms of what's my skill and comfort level with a crosswind. What's the most I've ever done without being white knuckled? What's the most I've ever done and felt like, okay, I still had some margin to spare. And we're gonna come back to that idea of margin. And then the second is what we were just talking about, the maximum demonstrated crosswind component of the airplane. What I can do in the Aztec is real different than what I can do in a 152. Um, and so those are the, so when, when you look at your weather forecast and you see that, that the winds are strong and gusty, what you want to, to look at is, okay, how, am I, how good am I? And ask that question in private so nobody else has to hear it. We all have egos, we know that. Um, and we, we don't like to admit that there are things that we can't do or that we're, not, we're a little rusty on, but we know we are. We are. And then the second part is, what am I flying? And you know, is the, are these conditions within the airplane's capabilities as well? Um, the, the, so here are a couple of questions that you can ask yourself. Can the pilot aircraft team handle the current and forecast conditions? Because current is one thing. There have been times when I've left my home airport and come back and found that the winds, gosh, it changed. What, how, what's up with that? It, it was supposed to be, or it, it was perfectly calm when I left, but winds kind of tend to kick up during the day. Do I know the power setting for maneuvering flight, um, the, the maneuvering speed at the expected weight? And that's good. That's an important consideration if you're going into turbulent conditions. And this is something that gets into, uh, you know, the wind, winds and thunderstorms are not, um, thunderstorm encounters are not something that you want to get into. So if you're flying in conditions that might be ripe for thunderstorms, do you have the equipment to avoid? Um, and if you don't have the equipment to avoid, you've got to stay out of the clouds and see and avoid and, and go around. All right, another thing weather can do. Who's instrument rated? You ever come, yeah, you ever come out of the clouds and seen this site? It's a beautiful thing. You know, you, it, oh, it's gorgeous. You know, you, you've been, you're flying and I, I see you're smiling. You can definitely, you've definitely done this too. You, you, you're in the clouds and you're following along and the needles are centered and you're doing your best to keep them centered. 
and suddenly you break out and look at that beautiful runway and the lights right in front of you, right where it's supposed to be. And it's if, if you weren't so busy landing the airplane, that's the time that you go, yes! But then, then what you do is after you're done and you can take your hands off, you go, yes! Yeah, I'm, that, that was good. So uh, yeah, one of the, the, the biggest things that weather can do is reduce ceiling and visibility, create clouds, wind, and fog. Okay, now this is, one of, this is a, a condition that I think is mostly something for, to, where you have to think about what the pilot can do. Because the airplane, yes, there are, there are airplanes that are not uh, equipped for flying in instruments, but let's face it, an airplane, it doesn't care if there are clouds or not. Uh, an airplane is an airplane. But what, what you have, so you do need to be flying an instrument equipped airplane, but your ability to be safe and aware and, and keep your situational awareness in weather depends an awful lot on the pilot. And uh, so I, I always think of, of the ceiling visibility as primarily a pilot issue. And the questions that you need to, to go through, are you instrument rated? Well, that's, that's a basic. If you're gonna go in instrument flying weather, then you need to be instrument rated. Are you legally current? Somebody tell me quick what legally current means. What is legally current? Say again. Six months, six approaches, yes. Okay. And and a hold and tracking courses and other things. Okay. Now let me ask you this. If you're legally current, are you safe? Not necessarily, that's exactly right. That's why that third word is up there, proficient. And you can be, you can have all the right numbers that are required for legal currency and you can be instrument rated and I would contend that those things are necessary but not sufficient. Sufficient means being proficient as well. And that means going on practicing. Um, I, I had a friend to call me the other day and said, hey, this looks like good cloud flying weather. Um, can you come out and let's let's go do some practice? And I wasn't able to do that, and it turned out the airplane wasn't available in, in, in any event. But but I was thinking, yeah, that that's a good thing, because this was about going out and there was no nothing convective, there was no freezing level uh, at, at the altitudes to worry about. So it was a good day to go out and just practice flying in the system. And, and, getting, um, and getting in some instrument approaches. And so I've, I've done that several times for pilots. I had one from the flying club um, a few months ago who said, uh, hey, you know, I know we're supposed to do my proficiency check today and we probably can't do the, the things that we can't do the stalls. And yeah, right, we're not gonna do that in the clouds. But he said, can we just go do some cloud flying and instrument approaches? And I said, absolutely. And, but I said, tell me why you think this is a safe thing to do today. And so he went through the, well, there are no thunderstorms and the freezing level is here and there's this and that. And also that there were plenty of places that we could get into. And uh, because I knew that he was proficient and the airplane was instrument equipped and we went out and we had a really good cloud flying session. So if you're instrument rated, I would certainly encourage you from time to time, go out and do that, get an instructor, um, go out and make sure that you still do have that proficiency and proficiency means a certain level of comfort. And I don't mean the kind of comfort where you would be, oh, well, this is no big deal. Because really, it's always a big deal. You want to have respect for it, but you can't be white knuckled. There's a balance to be struck between, um, you know, he I, let's call it healthy respect. Um, because if you're fearful, it's not gonna, it's not gonna do you any good. Okay, here's some questions to ask yourself if weather, ceiling, and visibility appear to be issues. Can I safely fly at the altitudes that I plan to fly? And that means can I stay out of the ice? Since if you're VFR, can I stay out of the clouds? Uh, do I have a terrain avoidance plan? And for terrain avoidance, do I know where all the rocks and trees and airplane stickers are? And by the way, that's my term for cell phone towers. Airplane stickers, you ever looked at radio towers and cell phone towers? That's exactly what they look like. And they pop up all over the place. There are thickets of the things and I'm very grateful for them because they make my toys, my electronic toys run, but you wanna watch out for them when you're flying. Uh, terrain avoidance also means, by the way, AOPA has a great uh, terrain avoidance plan and it involves uh, taking a look at things on the sectional like the grid squares and making sure that if you don't have any other way to stay out of the rocks, stay above the altitude in that grid square and you're gonna, you're gonna stay out. 
Are seal and invisibility okay for the approach? And that means more than just above the minimums because um, there are minimums and then your, there are personal minimums, which we're gonna talk about in a second. Do I need an alternate? What's the alternate rule? Anybody remember? One, two, and three, yeah, an hour before, an hour after, 2,000 foot ceiling and three miles of visibility. Yep, that's what it is. So if it's less than that, then you're gonna need to, to, to designate an alternate. But here's the thing, you can find a legal alternate to put on your flight plan, but it's not gonna be helpful if that alternate is outside your fuel range. So one of the, you have to look at alternates in terms of not only does it meet the, that legal criteria for an alternate, but is it something you can really get to? and you can practically get to. Um, which leads to the next one, where is the nearest good weather? And this used to be a lot harder to do, but in the days of, of all the weather graphics that we have at our fingertips now, it's much, much easier. Um, we'll look at that in a second too. And then are conditions within your personal minimums, and I'm gonna talk about personal minimums too. Now, here's just, a, uh, I, I took this screenshot last year. If you look at the bottom, 30th of March, 2011, um, and this was the reason, and if you look at that magenta line there, that was the route that uh, we would have taken flying the Cessna 182 down here from Leesburg. And can you see why that was not a good idea? Yep. Um, Sky Vector is one of the sites I like. You know, I have a lot of, of weather on my iPad now. But uh, Sky Vector was one of the earlier sites that I started looking at, and I just love this one because at a glance, and with, it, with a lot of the sites now, you can see this, you can look at a sectional chart and they'll have circles on there that show you where, just at a glance whether the weather is VFR, marginal VFR, IFR, or low IFR. And uh, green is good, um, green is VFR, so you look at it, and if, if you look at this one, this was all taken last March for getting ready for sun and fun. Um, now you start to get a little bit further south and you've got marginal VFR and IFR. See those blue and, and red dots? Um, now, I, and here's another little trick. I think of the sectional chart as the box that I can operate in, both in terms of my airplane's range and my personal physiological range too. And if it's not like flying off the edge of the earth, but really, I look at the weather within a sectional chart, and if you look at it and there's no good weather within the space of a sectional, maybe you might not want to do this. Uh, you want to know where there is good, um, where good weather happens to be. All right, now look as, as this trip progressed further to the south. Um, see all the red? Now, and now you're starting to see both red and magenta. Magenta is low IFR. So now we're starting to see uh, the further south this trip would have gone, the worse the weather was, gonna go, was going to be. And then uh, you start getting into it even more. So I, I just pulled up several sectionals here to show how you can start looking at it to, to get a sense of where the good weather is. So if you're looking for an alternate, the first thing you, I would encourage you to ask yourself is, is there something good that is in on the sectional chart? If not, Maybe stop right there, I would. Um, but if, if there's something good, then just make a mental note to yourself, is that weather north, south, east, or west of me? And then the next question is, okay, so how, how far do I have to go to get to it? And do I have the range? Do, am I gonna have enough fuel to get to that good weather? And if you can't answer affirmatively to those questions, stop. Get a cup of coffee, have a nice morning. I've, I've done that before, I'm like, well, all right, I can't fly today, so I'll think about flying or I'll write about flying. It's sick, I, I mean, this habit is. Okay, the next thing, uh, what can weather do and affect aircraft performance, high density altitude and ice? And I always think about it, when these conditions exist, it is mostly about the airplane. And the reason is, that uh, you could be super pilot, and no matter how good your skills are, even super pilot has limits when flying a super cub. So if you are flying an airplane that has limitations, that, you know, we all know what the short field takeoff technique is and what this is and that is. However, if you're flying an airplane that can't do that, your technique 
is not going to be ever good enough to overcome the limitations of the airplane. And this is a great pilot trick, by the way, for the people, because we don't, we like to impress people. We all know that. And we like to, we don't like to tell family and friends that we can't do things, but you can blame it on the airplane. If there's something that you don't feel comfortable doing, you can say, ah, well, I could, but the airplane is just not good enough. And by the way, this is a reason to buy a better airplane, or this is a reason to rent a better airplane. So there are all sorts of things that you can do with that technique. But, but just keep in mind that there are things that an airplane cannot do. So ask yourself, what is the uh, expected performance, takeoff and landing distances, climb and cruise performance, and this is a big one, what's the forecast freezing level? There is not an airplane that can take ice. Ice belongs in drinks, not on airplanes. Ice is a recipe to bring an airplane back to Mother Earth very quickly and you just don't want to go there. So if the freezing level, and there are some great tools. Does everybody know about ADS? I hope you do. Uh, ADS has some wonderful tools now, and they, there's some icing forecast and prediction tools that you can look at. And they've got all sorts of disclaimers, you know, that we, because there's a lot that we still don't know about ice. However, it's still great stuff, and it'll, it'll help you figure out where, where it's likely to be, and it'll help you a lot in your planning. One other thing about performance. Um, you remember ground school where you had to do triple interpolations for a two-knot wind difference? I hate that. Um, I think that's going to change sooner rather than later. But let me tell you that precision academics is not what performance planning is about. What I do is I take the most conservative numbers and then I add a safety margin to it. I do not sit there and do triple interpolations and come up with a, you know, a two-foot difference in takeoff and landing distance because really, if you have to calculate to the point that two feet makes a difference, you're asking the wrong questions. You should not be. You you really shouldn't be doing it at all. So uh, so just take. But but don't let the fact that you didn't like doing that when you did ground school make you blow off doing performance planning. Use the charts to, to get a, a, a conservative number, you know, just take the next one and then, uh, and then add a safety margin to it and go from there. Uh, airspace. What is airspace about? And um, the, here's where you want to always know where you are. And uh, the, the chart up there on the top with all the colors on it, that's my home airspace. Washington, D.C., Tri-Area Class B and Special Flight Rules Area. Uh, there's a lot of complicated airspace out there, and you want to make sure that you know before you go. Uh, you can use the movie map and chart. Uh, verbal position calls to yourself, because you always want to make sure that you, um, that, that you don't lose situational awareness, even when you've got the moving map. Um, Make sure that you know how to use the radios, use flight following. There are a lot of ways that you can make sure that you're clear in the airspace. Reality. And I want to spend a little bit of time with this one, what's really happening. All right, take a look at this. Um, when we look at, at tires and we look at, you know, when we talked about earlier about the airplane and making sure that you're aware of what the airplane is doing, aware of what the weather is really doing, not what you would like for it to do to be doing. And you know, when you look at gauges, sometimes you, does that gauge really off or, you know, and you may really want it to be in the right place, but it's not. So I think part of being situationally aware as a pilot and certainly being safe is take a real hard nose look at reality all the time. What's really happening is different from what I would like to be happening. The last thing uh, on that aware checklist I gave you before is external pressures. Um, who, who or what is pushing me and what can it do and what can I do to be safe? The first part is sometimes the hardest to do. There have been flights that I've taken and, and you know, I've been, I found myself pressing on because I've been worried that somebody at the other end was going to worry if I didn't get there. And then I'd say to myself, you know, I'd really give them something to worry about if I pressed on. I better do, and there was one time in particular where I diverted, and um, I, it was my mother that I was, I was worried about making my mother worry, and I diverted because the weather, I was going toward, mountains were going up, ceiling was coming down, and I was looking at this little window and thinking, this is not good. And so turned around, went to a, another airport and landed, and when I did and called her, you know, 
on the cell phone. She was so happy that I had made a good decision. And from then on, I thought, yep, okay, yeah, that's, but, but really dig down and try to make sure that you understand what it is that's pushing you to do something that you know you shouldn't do. And we've all done it at some one point or another. And then you get down and you say, now how can I have done something that dumb? And I think external pressures, particularly the ones that we haven't identified, uh, because once you know what it is that's pushing you, you know you can say, well, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. And so make sure that, that you do that. I want to wrap up with some thoughts on uh, personal minimums. And there's an, a, sort of an official definition there. Uh, an individual set of guidelines for deciding whether and under what conditions to continue operating. And this is also a part of your situational awareness, but I want to give you a different way to think about personal minimums. There's an abstract definition and it's fine, but think of that as like your fuel reserve. Personal minimums are a safety reserve between the skills and aircraft performance required for the flight that you want to make and for the skills and aircraft performance available to you uh, through training, proficiency, and currency. So if you think about that as the reserve, now remember um, they, they also need to be tailored to individual training experience, et cetera, with winds, a ceiling, and visibility, and also consistent with the characteristics of the pilot and aircraft team. Now, um, Here's, uh, if I'm gonna get, I, I do a whole seminar on this and there's some material available on fasafety.gov or you can send me an email later and I'll be glad to send it to you. But I'm just gonna give you a real quick, um, here's a way to think about your personal minimums. This is just a reminder of what uh, ceiling and visibility categories are for when we look at that. Um, and then here's, you also wanna look at uh, what's the shortest runway you've landed on, what's the, the heavy, the highest wind that you've landed in. And then I have a little chart that you can fill out. This is one of those things you can do on a rainy day when you can't go flying. You can sit there and, and, and just kind of go through your logbook or your mental logbook and say, what is the strongest wind I've ever flown in? What's the lowest uh, VFR, or IFR ceiling of visibility I've ever been in? And when you say lowest, I always think of it as being the lowest that you have comfortably been in. And when I say comfortable, I mean you felt like you had some safety margin to go. And if you fill that out, um, then you want to uh, remember that uh, those are normal conditions. And if you have ex extraordinary conditions, you want to add something to them. They need to slide up and down. Um, so if, you are, if you're feeling bad, then you might want to add something. Uh, if you're flying a different aircraft, uh, if you're going to some place that's unfamiliar, and especially if you have those must-meet deadlines, that's the time when you need to give yourself some extra. I had a guy in one of my seminars one time who told me that he added another 500 feet for his wife and 1,000 for each child. And I said, does your wife know that? We promised to keep that a secret, and his identity is still secret, but uh, whatever works for you, use whatever works, um, you know, as, as your personal minimums. And I would encourage you to write this down and to share it with your passengers so that they know that there are some decisions that you've already, that you've made in advance and that you know exactly uh, what you're going to do or not do under circumstances. And when I teach pinch hitter seminars, which I do from time to time, I always encourage the, um, the companion pilot, male or female, that to remember that they are the conscience of the person in the left seat and to ask about personal minimums and to, uh, to ask things like, okay, so tell me about the weather today. Are these with the, is that within your personal minimums? And it doesn't have to be as confrontational as I just said it, but, but the idea is, is to educate your passengers to the fact that you have, you have already made some decisions and it's for your safety and theirs and everything else. And that, that will help you resist some of the pressures that you might otherwise feel. Now, are personal minimums carved in stone once you have developed them? Um, I would contend that they are not. Uh, there, are, there are times when it's appropriate to adjust them, but no matter how much your passengers whine, never weaken or change personal minimums for a specific flight. The whole point of having them is to have made some decisions in advance and then stick to them. And if somebody says, but, but can't we please go? And you know that it's wrong. Well, like I said, no matter how much somebody else whines, 
that's the decision that you've made in advance. Another, if you're going to change personal minimums, and you know what you set when you first start flying and what you've done after you've got 10,000 hours or so, they're gonna be different. Um, but wh when, you're, it, when you experiment, you remember high school science, you always keep all the, uh, everything constant except for the variable that you want to experiment with. Um, if you decide that you want to, to fly with lower, seal, uh, lower visibility, uh, and you've been flying comfortably in seven to 10, and you want to go down to three to five, well, you want to go out and do that on a day when you don't have external pressures, when you don't have a deadline to meet, you don't have passengers necessarily. You, I mean, you know what I'm saying. You want to make sure that you keep everything as constant as you possibly can so that you can get comfortable in, in moving the envelope a little bit further in the area that you want. Another thing that is always a good idea if you're going to do that is talk through those plans with an instructor. Go get an instructor to go with you. Uh, or, or a, a, a more experienced pilot, somebody who can help you safely expand the edges of the envelope that you're flying in. Um, rules to live by, don't cut into your skill reserve. So this is, this is one of the reasons when you're setting up personal minimums, I encourage you to think about what it is that you're comfortable doing because you need to have a margin. Just like you have to have a fuel reserve now, are you supposed to plan a flight so that you cut into the fuel reserve? No. You're supposed to land, even if you've landed at an alternate, you're supposed to land with that reserve in the tank. And I would strongly encourage you to make sure that you plan flights when you're, you're thinking about, and this is part of the whole situational awareness, being aware of what you can do, what the airplane can do. Don't ever plan a flight that's gonna push you or the airplane into your skill reserve. You wanna make sure that you've got something extra left over. And I love this one. Don't ever go to the unusable fuel level of aircraft performance or piloting ability because you'll be doing what this little doggy, I love this picture, you know, just getting, really trying to scrape to the absolute bottom to get where, uh, where he needs to go. So you want to, uh, as you're stretching your personal minimums, gain experience, reassess and review. And then finally, um, you just, you modify with as much care as you possibly can. So, um, the last thing is sticking to the plan, and this is sometimes the hardest to do. But again, having it written down and talking to other people about it, talking to your passengers, talking to uh, the people who are waiting for you at the other end, and making sure that they understand that you, just like the airlines, you have certain criteria that determine whether you're gonna go or not and, uh, and, and under what conditions. And each pilot's um, response is unique, which brings me to another point. A friend of mine has a saying about pilot inertia. A pilot in motion tends to stay in motion. And he also has a similar theory about pilots and sheep that uh, they tend to follow along and just do what the last person has done. Have you ever been at airports, the non-towered airports, and everybody's flying in the pattern and, and so the wind's starting to shift and everybody keeps doing the same thing and you become the airplane that says, I'm going to switch the pattern. Yeah, you're nodding, you've done that, I've done that too. Um, the fact that every other pilot is doing something doesn't mean that it's good for you to do too. And here's another little rule, I get, I, I've collected a bunch of these over the years. One of them is, if you have to use the word probably in association with any part of your flight planning, you had definitely better rethink it. Because here, let me give you an example. Oh, we probably have enough fuel to get there. You wanna go? I don't think so. I wanna know that I got enough fuel to get there. Or we probably have enough range, or the weather will probably be good enough when we get there. If you catch yourself using that word, that's a time to go back and rethink everything and make sure that you are truly aware of, of what you need to be doing. And I'm gonna leave you with the last couple of things. Just take a quick look at this. And if I were going from, say, the, or the right side of that chart uh, to the left, so basically going east to west, would you go? Some would say yes and some would say no. But what, what, what can you tell me for sure about that? The, well, the weather is getting worse as I go to the west. 
Now, if you, whether or not you would go, I mean, everybody in this room has a different level of experience in a different airplane. And for some people, it would be a perfectly reasonable decision to go. And for other people, it would not. Just because other people are doing it doesn't mean that it's good for you. Make, you know, like my parents told me when I was a little kid, make your own decisions, stand on your own feet. Um, here's another one. This gets a little trickier. Definitely the weather is, is worse on this, um, on this side. Um, we're starting to get into not just marginal VFR, but also IFR. And then here's another one. Now, how, how, what about this one? Looks like a pretty nice day to fly, huh? Now, that's just ceiling and visibility, so you still have to look at winds and a few other things. But um, that's, uh, you know, the, again, just the, it, it's a great way to start looking at, at things. Just take a big picture look at whatever tool that you want to use. Look at the sectional and see what the weather is, and it'll, it'll help you decide what you want it to do. Okay. And then here is just a last look. Just remember your weather in terms of wind, ceiling, and visibility and performance. And um, there is, I know that you got the QR code at the beginning with my email address, um, but there it is as well. Um, just make sure that if you're trying to find me, do not pluralize me. It usually scares people if they think of me as being more than one. People tend to put an S on my last name. And uh, fasafety.gov has a lot of great material. And I'm also going to put a plug in for the magazine back there, FA Safety Briefing. Uh, one of my jobs is to be the editor of the magazine. Uh, we try very hard. We're all pilots on the staff, and we try really hard to make sure that we provide content that is relevant and current and useful and comes of, out of our experience to share with you. So please take a copy with you and enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you for coming.